The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, now over, I've been giving out uh, the muddy cards for a few of the lectures, and two or three questions came up in those that I haven't addressed so far, and I'm kind of calling them loose ends. And I'm going to pick up on a couple of those today. I think they'll help you kind of consolidate the knowledge around the quiz. And so I'm going to a couple of loose ends there. And then I'm, the lecture topic I started last time, which is making this transition from thinking about angular momentum of particles to using the full angular momentum equations for rigid bodies where we talk about mass moments of inertia and products of inertia. And that's where we'll pick up there again today, because that's where we're going for the next few lectures. OK. Let's pick up with and a first example here. This is, this is on the topic of basically finding equations of motion. And there's been a little confusion with people I noticed, who've asked me, you know, well, what do you mean find? Do you mean solve, et cetera? And so I'm going to go through a, just a real quick example, skipping some of the steps, because the, the, my purpose is emphasizing the steps, not working out all the details. So um, finding equations of motion, where does it begin? So really one of the really important steps is this determine the number of independent coordinates you need. Because when you've done that, that tells you basically the, uh, that's also the number, it really starts finding the number of degrees of freedom. Should have put this in different order. Degrees of freedom tells you the number of independent coordinates you need. So this is one, two, and then three. That leads you to the number of equations of motion that you need. So this is really an important step. Secondly, draw. free body diagrams. And third, apply summation of forces, external vector equations gives you mass times acceleration, and summation of torques gives you d h d t plus this v cross p term. Well, well, so this is just kind of the step by step. So let's apply it briefly. We've talked a lot about things on hills. So here's a cart. It's got wheels. Attached by a cord to a second mass that's sliding. M1, M2, doesn't stretch the cord in between. <clears throat> and let's think of these things as rigid bodies. So how many degrees of freedom? How many possible degrees of freedom? To sort of the maximum possible. You have how many rigid bodies? Two. How many degrees of freedom for rigid bodies possible? Six each. So we're at six times m plus three times n minus the number of constraints is the number of independent degrees of freedom. This is the number of rigid bodies, number of particles. So we have six times two, three times zero minus the constraints. So this one comes up 12 minus the constraints. <coughs> You have to figure out the constraints quickly. Well, we're not going to allow 
rotation in any of the three directions on either of them. There, there aren't carts, they're big, they're sliding, they're not rolling, any of that. So no rotation for three, no rotation for three more. That's minus six. So C equals minus six, or C equals six for rotation. And then what else can we say? There's no, I'll like designate this the y direction so we can talk about directions here. And I'll designate this x in general. No acceleration at all in the y, in the y direction, right? Can't move in the y. So that gives us 1, 2 for each mass, plus 2 more. That's 8 constraints that we've come up with. Now, a ninth constraint is the fact that these two are tied together. And so if you had temporarily assigned a coordinate here, x1, and another one here, x2, we know for a fact that x1 has got to be equal to x2. And that gives you yet one more constraint. So that's 9. And let's, so we might just stop there. We say, OK, that's a total of 9. So the number of degrees of freedom, 12 minus 9 is 3. And that implies you need three equations of motion. Some confusion comes, you know, if something's not cons let me, let me start with this. Start, rephrase that. We haven't talked anything about the z direction. I haven't described any constraints in the z direction. If, you're, if this is me in a car and I'm dragging a sled down a hill, or I'm in a vehicle and I'm dragging a sled down a hill, I don't know if you've ever been in a vehicle on a trailer on an icy, with a trailer on an icy road in the wintertime. That's a dicey maneuver, OK? So uh, going down a hill with a, trying to put brakes on. So this thing could conceivably move in this direction. And you can either constrain it to be that way to make the problem simple, or you can just say it's possible. So we have three equations of motion, of which two for now, the summation of the forces external in the, since I've got x and y, z must be this way, in the y direction, and we'll make it in z direction, this is coordinate system 1. So this would be z1 or z2. Some of these the forces, z1 is m1, y, <laughs> z1 double dot. But I'm going to set that equal to 0. I just know of no forces. So this becomes a trivial equation of motion. And another one, summation of the forces on the second mass. This is on m2 in the z2 direction, is m2 z2 double dot. And I'm going to set that equal to 0 also. So what it boils down to, I had three degrees of freedom, two trivial equations of motion leaving me with just one equation of motion that's going to be meaningful. Yeah? If x1 is equal to x2, um, could that, would that mean that the rod has to be entirely along the x-axis? So that, that would mean that... So he, he asks, asks if x1 equals x2, does that mean they both have to be along the x-axis? I'm assuming that. So I really am assuming this thing's going down the hill. I'm making a point about this z-direction thing because it's just a subtlety that you have to decide on when you're, figure, when you're figuring out how to actually analyze the situation. If you really were thinking about what happens when a vehicle is going down a steep, icy hill, towing a trailer, maybe put the brakes on, maybe not, uh, you could probably say, well, unless I really have disaster, we're not going to get uh, 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 rollovers and things like that. But you could imagine that it can, it can get out of the x direction, right? It could start sliding in the z. Uh, probably not going to go anywhere in the y. That's still a good assumption. So it, this, is about, this is about modeling and how complicated do you make the modeling. So you actually have to make quite a few modeling decisions when you go to do this. And we tend in class and examples tend to really oversimplify problems so that we can do them, all right? So I've boiled this down to where I'm going to end up with one significant equation of motion. OK. <clears throat> so 
And that one's going to say that the summation of the forces in the x direction, and I'm just going to write m x double dot here, not putting down m1s or m2s, because we're going to have to go to free body diagrams to figure out what we, how to apply this. Okay. So free body diagrams. First mass. So this is M1 here. M1G, a normal force, no doubt a friction force. I'll call that F1 and a tension in the cord. And I'm assuming that tension is going to always be there. So if you get in a situation where the trailer starts overtaking the car, I mean, the rope goes slack. We're not going to consider that one today. Okay. So there's your free body diagram for the first one. And we're going to need to break mg into a couple of components. We're going to need the slope here. And that translates into an angle here. So there's our first free body diagram and our second free body diagram, second mass, tension, normal force. Another M, 2G. And this one's on wheels, and we're going to assume that consider this one frictionless, so we don't have any friction force holding it back. So the reason I've kind of, this seems like a you know, ridiculously simple problem, but the point I want to make is not the solution, not the particular problem, but an issue that crops up. How many unknowns are there in this problem? Two. Well, do you know N1 immediately, or N2, or the friction force, or the tension? or, for that matter, the x double dot we're looking for. There's actually, you start off this problem with five unknowns. But only, you're only looking to derive one equation of motion. So the fact that we're looking for one equation of motion doesn't say you don't have to deal with several intermediate equations to get there. That's just part of the, part of the work. Okay, so this is five unknowns to start with. N1, N2, F1, T, and X double dot. Okay. Now, I'm not going to, so that if you'll find out that the summation of the forces on Y and the Y1 on the first mass, <coughs> this one, this gives you N1. Summation of the forces in the Y direction on M2. This one gives you N2 directly. From this flows directly, you know that the friction force is mu N1. See, that's a third equation. So this gives you one equation. This gives you another equation. This gives you a third equation. You have five unknowns, you need five equations. So there's three of them right off the top. So this leaves, you've solved for those, this leaves T and X double dot to solve for. So now the sum of the forces on mass one in the X direction says M1 X double dot. And the sum of the forces on the second mass in the x direction gives you m2 <coughs> x double dot. And did I, if I, if I was explicitly haven't said this yet, what I've done is one of my requirements is x1 equals x2, and I'm just going to call them x 
Both of these are exactly the same. Both masses have to move with the same motion as the assumption. So that means that x1 double dot equals x2 double dot equals x double dot. And that's what I'm assuming when I'm writing down these two equations. Okay? If I can write those two equations, one from each free body diagram, I've already eliminated three of the unknowns. And now, because I have two equations, each have t in them. Essentially, you eliminate t and solve for x double dot. And if you do that in this problem, you get your equation of motion. Eliminate t, solve for x1 double dot, and look at this, and just look at things that doesn't make sense. This says the total mass times the acceleration. It's a system. It's one system. Mass times the acceleration of the center of gravity of the system, if you will, has got to be equal to the sums of the forces on it. Well, it's got m1 plus m2 g sine theta pulling it down the hill, and it has minus m mu m1 g cosine theta, dragging it back up the hill. And that's the entire equation of motion. It makes sense. But the, the equation of motion, the thing you're looking for, is the one that ends up with this acceleration term in it. If you have multiple degrees of freedom, multiple coordinates, if you have, let's say, three significant equations of motion in the result, they, there won't necessarily be one in terms of each coordinate. They'll have the coordinates mixed in them. Like we did that two mass system with springs the other day, each equation of motion had x1 and x2 in it. They don't necessarily separate. They're coupled through their coordinates. This one, it's a one equation of motion for the system, therefore you have only one coordinate in it. But that's not generally true of multiple degree of freedom systems. Okay, that's your, your, your method though for a simple problem. Now let's do I want to do a, um, a little more difficult problem that involves rotation. Okay, rotation, right. And this is a problem, I'm sure you've done this problem in physics. It's a classic problem that people do. A disc, a pulley, really. Supporting two masses. Rotates about this point, which I'll call A here. Assign some theta. There's no, sl no slip. So theta is going to be related to movement, x. And I'm going to assign this one a coordinate, x1 going down, this one a coordinate, x2 going up. A little foreknowledge here, because you've worked the problem. So I, I want to solve for the motion of this system. Now again, we need to know the number of degrees of freedom. So it's the maximum possible which is our 6m plus 3n minus the constraints. And let's think about uh, you know, how we want to model this again. This time, I'm just going to model these as particles. Doesn't matter how big they are. And my problem, really, they only go up and down. So if I model them as particles, this is 6 times 0 plus 3 times 2 minus the constraints. So 6 minus the constraints. So the issue is really how many constraints. Well, we're going to require x1 equal x2. 
cord's taut, doesn't stretch. If this thing goes down, that has to go up exactly an equal amount. Okay, and that's one constraint. Okay, and that leaving us six minus one is five, leaving us with a lot of degrees of freedom here. Now, kind of back to the issue I was making before. Are there any constraints in the, I'll call it uh, x, y, z directions here? Are there any constraints in the y or z directions on either of those masses? No, I haven't just shown any. No tracks, no guides, no anything. So technically, there are no additional constraints in this problem. But if there's no forces in the y, uh, x, I guess, y this way, and no forces in the z, I'm going to end up with two trivial equations of motion for this one, one in the y, one in the z, for this one, one in the y, one in the z. So back to this issue of there's a difference between constraints and trivial equations of motion. We're going to have four trivial equations of motion. So I really, again, I'm going to come down to one significant equation of motion. So I have one constraint four trivial ELMs and one significant equation of motion. OK. <clears throat> now, because I want to talk about rotation, we need to pick a, we need to pick a coordinate. Now, I can pick. I can either let x1 equal x2 and just let it be just some x, a single coordinate, or theta, the rotation. I'm actually going to use x for a second. But there's, there's two obvious ways to approach this problem. One is to sum, is to draw free body diagrams of each of these masses, sum the forces on each. And how many, if I do that, how many unknowns do I end up with? When we can start, we'll, we can draw the free, here's the free body diagram for mass one. What's it got on it? Well, it's M1G. What's the other, what else is acting on it? And here's the second one, M2G and tension acting on it. So now we can sum, sum, sum of the forces equals mass times the acceleration of each one. And the external forces are going to involve t. So you're going to end up with how many unknowns? How many unknowns? When I, yeah, I can write two equations, <coughs> sum of the forces in the x direction. x double dot, certainly an unknown. What else? T. t. So I end up with two. I end up with this other unknown. So that means I'm going to have to write two equations. I'm going to have to eliminate t. I'm going to go through the same thing there. So I don't want to bother with that. Is there another way to do this problem? So this is a problem where you can use angular momentum and not have to deal with t at all. So let's set that problem up. So you know that the sum of the torques about that point A, with respect to point A, is going to be derivative, and since we're dealing with particles here, of the angular momentum with respect to, I'll just call it lowercase h for particles, plus this velocity of A with respect to an inertial frame cross the linear momentum with respect to an inertial frame. That's the full equation for sum of torques. What's velocity of A with respect to O in this problem? Zero. So that's fortunately, this is one of those problems you can get rid of this, new, this, this difficult second term. So it's just torques is the time derivative of the angular momentum. So we need an expression then for both the sum of the torques with respect to A, and let's see, what would that be? <coughs> the, so now the external torques with respect to 
the, uh, and I'll finish my, whoop, come here you, free body diagram. So now, what I really want is a free body diagram of the whole system. So here's the whole system treated as one thing. You have a force down, M1G, another force down, M2G. Up here you have some normal force up. That's the support at the pin. Now you have tensions in these, but now this equation applies. It, this equation applies to the system. The T's are internal to the system. They are irrelevant. So I'm talking about this whole thing treated as a system, and I'm going to compute the moments about point A, which is right there where that axle is. Does N create a moment at the axle? Nope. But do M1 and M2 create, times G create moments? Sure, OK. So <clears throat> I'm going to have positive out of the board be positive moment positive angular direction. So the torques applied to the system are R cross T. So you're going to end up with, I want to summarize these, an M1 G. And I didn't write the radius on this problem, but has some radius, capital R. So the torques are M1 G R positive minus M2GR, okay. k-hat direction. And that must be equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum about A. Now, we need an expression for the angular momentum with respect to A. Angular momentum is, in general, this is a, it's R cross linear momentum, right? So R for mass 1 with respect to A cross the, the momentum of that second mass with respect to an inertial frame. And A and the inertial frame are the same thing. A is fixed in the inertial frame. But the angular momentum is always with respect to the inertial frame. Plus the second piece, which is R of M2 with respect to A crossed with P for mass 2 with respect to some inertial frame. OK? So I'm just going to give you the results to this. M1 plus M2. R x dot k. So x dot is this velocity. R cross uh, that, and mass times velocity is momentum. So uh, the perpendicular radius to that is the radius r. So it's r x dot times m, shouldn't surprise you, in the k hat direction. That's the total angular momentum that comes from these two particles with respect to A. And taking their time derivative, these are constant. That's a constant. This is not. This is a constant, but it doesn't change direction. So this one, pretty simple. And now I can set equal the sum of the external torques. That to the time derivative of the angular momentum, just to fulfill this expression. And in so doing, I end up with a solution for x double dot. m1 minus m2, m1 plus m2 times g. Turns out the r goes away. Never had so one equation. Never had to mess with tension. This is a, a, a pretty nice direct way of solving this problem. This if you solve for g here, 
and you measure x double dot, this actually gives you an experimental way of determining acceleration of gravity. And it's actually what, the, what this thing was used for a long time ago before they had a lot of the measurement techniques and things that we do today. This is a way of determining the acceleration of gravity. So these two masses are quite close together. This, this number is pretty small. And you can, you know, however accurate your timing device is. OK. Now, just to mention it, I neglected something in this. I assumed something. I didn't even say it. What was it? What would screw up this measurement? I'm trying to measure the acceleration of gravity. If I built this apparatus, how would I, would I get a very good measurement? The pulley would have to be, would have to be massless. Yeah, pulley would have to be massless. I've made an assumption about that, right? So how would you fix up this equation to account for the pulley? You'd have to take into account the momentum of inertia. Yeah, you put in something. And where would that go into the problem? How would you account for the mo its inertia, moment of inertia in the problem? Yeah, you just put it into HA. So there's going, this expression for H would end up with one more term. It's going to look like, uh, <clears throat> well, when you take the time derivative, you're going to end up with another piece over here, some i about a theta double dot. And you're going to have to relate theta double dot to x double dot, which you can, because x equals r theta. x double dot's r theta double dot. And you could fix that, and you'd have a, an equation of motion. But that means we need to know about i about a, which we're, that's where we're going to uh, at the for the next, at the end of this lecture and for the next several lectures. OK, that's that example. And I've got two more brief ones that I want to talk about. Any last questions? Yeah. Can you explain again why you didn't uh, take the tensions into account for your symmetry? OK, so why did I, did I not take the tensions into account? So I can write the <coughs> equation of motion for this thing as a complete system. One, if the masses and the pulley are all the same thing, and the summation, uh, it's a, the summation of the torques, external torques on that, are going to mount up to taking into account the time rate of change of the angular momentum of the system. Now, if I had didn't understand that, I could have blindly gone ahead and put the t's in there, right? But they would have been exactly equal and opposite with respect to a, and it would have canceled out. So either way, if you're not sure about that assumption, you could just put them in, and they would appear in the torque equation, but as a minus tr and a plus tr, and they'd cancel. OK, <clears throat> I want to make a uh, move on to a third example. And this is the uh, third p item that I want to clear up, loose ends I'm calling them. When the muddy cards are really useful. I get questions in those that, that <coughs> spark something. And this is a question that came up two or three times in the muddy cards, and I haven't addressed it. And that is, you know, we, did, we were working with rotor problems. And remember this problem. Here's our rotor. Had an arm. I did it this way to make some things obvious. But uh, this is the z direction. It's rotating about that axis. I've got a point mass up here, r hat. So this is r. Actually, I'm going to use, make it a capital R so it's easier to distinguish from the r hat. And this is z in the. <coughs> This thing's rotating. It's got bearings here. To keep it going. And we wanted, we were taught, we talked about torques. So this is my point A. I want to write the sum of the torques about A time derivative of the angular momentum. I mean, we've done this problem before, so I'm just putting up a couple of points for review to clear up some possible 
misconceptions. Plus this term. So what about point A now in this problem? What's the velocity of point A? Zero. So again, we can get rid of this guy. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this, do an example one of these days where this isn't zero, where it's really handy to, to, have, to be able to do a problem where that's not zero. OK. This is true. I need a free body diagram of our little mass. So here's my free body diagram. And it has possibly a force in the z direction that come from the rod. There's a rod that's supporting this thing, right? There's possibly a force in the z direction. There's a force in the r hat direction, the r direction. There's a force in the theta direction going into the board. And there's mg. Okay. All sorts of forces on this thing. And the question was asked, when we did this problem before and did the time derivatives of the angular momentum, we found that we got, there's three terms, and I'll, I'll write them down here for you. I'm just, I'm just saying in advance what we're going to do. When you solve this problem, you find out that it takes torque to accelerate the shaft and spin. That's the driving one. That's what makes it happen, makes it accelerate. We had two more terms that were torques at this point. That is what it takes to support the system. It's trying to bend out. It's trying to bend back. Those are torques that show up here. And we actually get them when we work through this. But we don't get a, something that tells us about the moment the torque created this point caused by gravity. So why, the question was, you know, why don't we get the torque about this point caused by gravity? It's clearly mg down. There's clearly a moment arm. So mgr is a torque about this point. And if you were doing the statics problem in 2001, there'd be a torque around this point caused by the weight of this thing, just sitting there, not even spinning. OK, and what we're doing here gives you no help with that. But just for a quick, just for the quick review of this problem, more in the line of helping you think about the quiz. This then is R, and we'll call this point B, and this is point A. Remember, this is R, B with respect to A, cross P with respect to O. Okay, and that's where angular momentum comes from. In this problem, that is R, R hat plus Z, K hat cross m times the velocity, which is r omega z. And that must be in the theta hat direction. So when you multiply these out, and theta, theta hat, omega z is theta dot. They're inter kind of interchangeable in this problem. So when you multiply this out, you get two terms, m r squared theta dot k hat minus m r z theta dot r hat. Two terms from this. And when you do the time derivative of dh dt, <clears throat> you get three terms, mr squared theta double dot in the k. Now, why do you get three terms? Because this term has two, var two variables in it that are functions of time. Theta dot has a derivative, and r hat has a derivative because it rotates. So one of the key bits of mathematics you have to kind of learn in this course, so I'm kind of giving you a little quiz review here, is you need to know how to take the derivative of a rotating vector. And that's what we do here. It gives us two terms, minus m r z theta double dot r hat minus m r z theta dot squared theta hat. So three terms in this time derivative of the angular momentum. And they have to be equal to the external torques. So 
So this is equal to the summation of the torques about A, the external torques. Well, you'll need a, a torque in the K direction. That's what it takes to accelerate the thing, make it go faster. This mass has a force on it to make it go faster. That's this F in the theta hat direction. And that rods haven't push on that mass. The mass pushes back on the rod. So if in the theta direction's like that, the mass pushes back on the rod, it twists the rod or tries to. That's a torque about this in the R hat direction. So there's centripetal acceleration. It takes force to cause centripetal acceleration. It's that force is inward. It's about a moment arm z. And so this gives you a torque about the point A in the theta hat direction. So these are three different terms. Each one has a purpose. No work is done here. No work is done here because there's no movement. Okay. Now, but gravity, we started this thing. question is, why doesn't gravity pop out of this? Because this only tells you about the time rate of change of angular momentum. And gravity has nothing to do with angular momentum. R cross P is all that angular momentum is. And the linear momentum of little clumps of mass times the radius from the point you're computing the angular momentum has nothing to do with G, never will. So you'll never get, you'll never get the G static moment, G related static moment out of this equation. It's there though. And if you were designing the system, you'd have to take it into account. So remember, I brought, I didn't bring it today, but I have my shaker. I bolted it to the floor. Inside of that shaker is a little rotating mass. It has a little arm and eccentricity. It has some mass that I'm going to make m. It's rotating the theta direction. And it rotates at constant speed. So it's some constant omega theta double dot equals zero. So I just got my shaker bolted to the floor. It's putting a lot of vibration into the floor. And the question that someone came up with on a muddy card that was a really in, insightful question, why, or they didn't say it why, they said shouldn't the torque required to drive this thing somehow be affected by gravity? Hmm. So does the torque that it takes to run this around and around depend on gravity? Was the question that was asked. <coughs> so let's take a, kind of take a quick look at that. We just discovered that the HDT doesn't tell you anything about torque from gravity, right? Well, let's see what happens then. So the summation of the external torques, and I'll call this now point A, where it's rotating about. This point now doesn't move in this problem. So it's an inertial point. Summation of the torques with respect to A <coughs> is dH with respect to A, dt, and there's no additional terms because it doesn't, that, that velocity point is zero. And that's d by dt. And the torque is just r cross p. So that is m e theta dot. That's the velocity. That's the momentum. And the uh, I've left out something. So R cross P, I need an E squared in here, M E squared theta dot in the k hat direction. I need to take the time derivative of that. That's a constant, that's a constant, that's a constant. It only comes from this term, okay? 
And that gives me m e squared theta double dot k hat direction. And that's got to be equal to the sum of the torques in the system, the external torques. And what are they? Well, and so torques about this point. So axial forces in this thing contribute no torques. Uh, transverse forces, external forces only come from the uh, mg on this thing. So my torques on the system, there is some mechanical torque being applied. That's what I'm looking for. I've got a motor driving this thing. So there's some T of T in there, some torque. Okay. Minus M G E cosine theta is the moment arm. So the, there's this force, there's this moment arm is E cosine theta. So this is the external torque caused by gravity. But all of this equals what? What's theta double dot? Zero. OK. The external torque is mge cosine omega t. Theta is omega t. And so indeed, as this thing goes around, when it's coming up, you got to apply enough torque to lift it against gravity. When it clears the top, gravity is helping it, going down the other side. So in fact, if you plotted the torque as a function of time for this system, it's like this. It's just lifting that mass up and down. And of course, if there's any friction in this thing, et cetera, it's going to have to apply a little bit of torque for that too. But indeed, this is an, is an insightful question that someone asked is that the uh, Gravity does have to have enter into this thing. So there will be a torque that the motor has to supply to drive this thing in, the, in gravity. Yeah? Should that expression also have, um, the expression for torque also have me squared theta double dot in the k? Ah, uh, but theta double dot is? Yeah, see, it would. If, I allow, if this thing was spinning up and I was trying to account for the torque required to spin it up, then I would actually, then here it is. I would, then I would include that. This would be the, an equation of motion that says all these things are true. And I could solve for t torque again. And it would allow me to decide how fast I could spin it up, right? If I have a dinky little motor, it doesn't spin up very fast. If I have a really powerful motor that can really put it to it, spin up quickly. OK. All right. So now I want to move on to the third topic, which is kind of go back to where I left off last time, talking about we need to move on from particles to rigid bodies so we can do more interesting problems. And so I want to pick up with the subject of angular momentum for rigid bodies. Now, last time I just barely scratched the surface of this, and lots of muddy cards says, I don't get it. I didn't expect you to get it uh, with, with it being half baked and the first time you've seen it. So, we're going to continue, and we won't finish today. So, let's uh, think about a general rigid body. Here's my. Uh, inertial system. Got a body out here that's rotating about some point A. A could even be outside the body and have it rotate about it. And attached to A is a reference frame. Little x, little y, little z. So it's my AXY frame. Now, I put up last time a, there's a two page, two pages out of Williams which gives the equations for the moments and products of inertia in terms of uh, summations of masses times particle locations. And in order to do that, Williams defines a coordinate system on this body. And that coordinate system is fixed to the body. 
rotates the body, and Williams calls that coordinate system little o x, y, z. And his, in his book, he calls the inertial frame big O x, y, z. It's really hard to do that on the blackboard and how you'd be able to tell it apart, OK? So I'm going to depart. And my frame in here is, my, is an A x, y, z frame. But A and O, so if you're reading that handout, are the same thing. A and little o. It's a frame fixed to the body that's rotating with it. We can write angular momentum for rigid bodies as a vector hx having a component in the i direction, j direction, in these coordinates. As the product of a matrix of, these, of constants. And these constants are these moments of inertia and products of inertia terms. And so forth. I'll write out a couple more of these. Y, Y. It's a symmetric matrix. And you multiply it by the components of the rotation that you are rotating this object. So here's a vector omega. This object is rotating about A. The direction, the axle, axis of rotation is like that. And you can break this rotation rate into components in the XYZ system. And that's what these are. These are the components of it. So you multiply out this matrix and a vector, you will get individual equations for the hx, hy, and hz components of the angular momentum of that object. Okay. Now let's consider, let's just do a case. Where the spin is only about the z-axis. We do lots of these problems. The, the book has a whole chapter on it. They're called planar motion problems. And just typically, we pick the spin around the z as a convention. And if you have a case like that, then h here. <coughs> is i times 0, 0, omega z. And you multiply that out, you get i x z omega z i y z omega z and i z z omega z. Vector times the square matrix gives you back a vector. That's what you get back. And if you want to write h as a vector, which we frequently do, h now this is with respect to a. And we'll find i here is also with respect to a. You have to be very careful in, in your construction of this matrix. It has to do with the point about which you are computing your angular momentum. OK, if you want to write this as a vector, then this becomes h x i hat plus h y j hat plus h z k hat. This is where the unit vectors come in. When you want to express this as a vector, 
you take these three components, and these are H, X, H, Y, H, Z. The first, this little double subscript, the first one tells you the component of H. This is HX, HY, HZ. The second one tells you the axis of rotation about which the object is spinning to give you this piece of angular momentum. So IXZ is HX spinning at rate omega Z. OK. Now, <clears throat> The direction of spin was, what's the unit vector in the direction of rotation for this problem? What's omega? He said we're going to start off with just direction. It's only spinning in the z direction. So it's spinning, just spinning in the z direction. But I multiply this thing out, I get three terms. And I get a term in the i, a j, and a k. Now, these two terms, so this is i, x, z, omega, z, i, plus i, y, z, <coughs> omega, z, j, plus i, z, z, omega, z, k. Okay, that's these three terms. These two terms exist because I've assumed that these off-diagonal terms are not zero. Now, the problem we started with, we started with an example last time, our bicycle wheel thing with the unbalanced masses on it. We used the Williams formulas to compute these different terms. <coughs> if the off-diagonal terms here are not zero, then when you write the angular momentum expression, you get part, parts of the angular momentum that are not in the direction of spin. That's, that's a really important conclusion. So the off-diagonal terms lead to angular momentum not in the direction of spin. And when you take the time derivative, you end up with torques, and they're, just, they're right back to this problem up here. The, if, if you have off diagonal terms in this matrix, when you spin it around one of its axes, it is dynamically unbalanced. Okay? So the off, if these are not zero, if you spin it around one of the axes of the system for which these are defined, in which these are defined, you find out that you get unbalanced torques in the system. So those two go together. Now, so and just another way of saying that is any time you this any time you end up with the angular momentum vector not pointing in the same direction as the rotation, then the system is going to be dynamically unbalanced. Okay. Let's, whoops, I want this one. Actually, I kind of want to keep the Atwood's machine here.
So we, this was our unbalanced bicycle wheel problem that we were, had talked about last time. I can simulate that with this. I basically have drawn it like this. So this is the problem. Now this thing, this thing is definitely is unbalanced. It's trying to do this as it as it goes around. Okay. And last time we actually worked up what the from the Williams formulas what the moment of inertia matrix looked like. So now this x, y, z system are attached and rotating with that frame. So my axis of spin is yeah, I've, this one's a little exaggerated. This one is like this one. That, that drawing is like this. The x is like that. So x is like this. Z is like that. Minus x minus z. So when this thing spins, that's the problem that's drawn there. Okay. And if I compute with those with Williams formulas, the various quantities. Um, so I, with respect to A, for this system, this, the first term, the IXX term, is summation MI, YI squared plus ZI squared, and so forth. You get a bunch of terms, and I will... Uh, Write out one other one here. This term over in the corner is mxz as ixz, and that's minus summation of the mi, xi, zi, and so forth. <clears throat> and if we went through and worked up each of these things, i with respect to a for this problem comes out m z1 squared 0 minus m x1 z1 0 minus m x1 z1 the middle term m x1 squared plus z1 squared 0 0 and m x1 squared. So that's what this mass moment of inertia matrix looks like for these two particles. Okay. So now if I want to write the angular momentum of this system <clears throat> using this new notation, I would say that it's I computed with respect to A times my omega. And let's, our case is 0, 0, omega z. Okay. And if we write that out, we do that, multiply that out, we end up with a minus m x1 z1 omega z 0 and m x1 squared omega z. And these are our three components, h, x, h, y, h, z. And if you wanted to write it as a vector, 
then you'd add the unit vectors, so the hx and the i, plus 0 for the hy, plus hz in the k. So what, now if you went and took the time derivative of those terms, what do you get? Torques. Torques. And you'll get three terms. When we did the example a minute ago, it's, what we're doing here is not very different from that. You're going to get the torque that it takes to accelerate it around the spin axis, but you're also going to get the torque, two derivatives of this one, to give you two terms, and these are the moments it torques about that center of the axle, in this case, trying to twist the system around, okay? Now, <clears throat> reach some closure here at a good stopping point. Here's our system. One last time, here's the z-axis. The angular momentum that comes out of this, you have a component hz in the z-direction, and you end up with a component, it's got a minus in it, in the x-direction, like this, <coughs> so that the total h vector with respect to a looks like that. And it's not in the direction of spin. It's actually perpendicular to our bar here. Okay. And it's dynamically unbalanced. So just to, uh, how do we make the transition from that to rigid bodies? The Williams formulas that are these say that if you want the mass moment of inertia of a body, all you have to do is sum up all the little mass bits at their correct distances off of, off of axes, and you will get it. So we, when you have particles, you can just add them up. When you have a rigid body, those summations become integrals. And for example, IZZ is the integral of, how do I, should I say this, x squared plus y squared dm, every little mass bit. Okay. All right, looks like, is there an exam uh, some distance away? I see a lot of people vanishing. Okay, so let me, I'll tell you what, I'll just make it easy for you and let you go. Let me just say one thing, so where we're going. For every rigid body, there is a different set of axes for which when you go to make up this matrix, you can make it diagonal. And those are called the principal axes, and that's where we're going next. Those play a really important role in what we want to do. Okay.